Hello and good morning everyone. We have the pleasure that you have joined our lecture for today. We are uh, happy to uh, to present Dr. Najib Ahmed Khan, Professor of Medical Microbiology, to talk about the war on terror cells, uh, specifically on the infectious uh, diseases. Welcome doctor and you have the mic. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll get straight to the to the presentation. Uh, what I've done is that I've divided the talk in two in two parts. So the first part, I believe that we all should be aware from community point of view, is this emerging threat to our community, also known as brain eating amoeba. I think it's very important. We need to be aware of this. We need to be recognize this problem because it seems to be emerging. And the second part after that, I'll focus on how we can come up with new sources of antibiotics or antimicrobials. So you, you keep hearing in the literature, you keep hearing in the, in the media and news channel that there is emergence of the superbugs and COVID-19 and all these kind of infections which are coming up. So I'm going to present to you some of the uh, relevant material, which hopefully will highlight that where should we look for new sources of uh, antimicrobials that can counter these threats. The first part first, so just focusing on brain eating amoeba, what is it? So it is basically a, a parasite which is um, gets into the brain of humans and uh, uh, causes death. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that um, if you get this parasite, uh, the mortality rate is almost 100%. That means that if you get it, you know, the patient will die. Even uh, the presence of uh, treatment and antibiotics and antimicrobials, uh, it is nearly 100% surety that person will die because there's no mechanism to treat this parasite. So the way that this parasite operates is that it can, uh, I hope you can see my cursor here, the organizer, if you can point out. Okay, probably you can. Uh, so the, the way this parasite works is that it gets into the nose when um, through contaminated water. And then through the nose, it then slowly creeps into the brain and once it gets into the brain, then it's very, very difficult to eradicate it. It's very difficult to, to, to kill it, and it results in uh, the post death. Um, so uh, this just to show you that um, the, we, previously kind of unknown, uh, but we observed uh, many, many cases of this parasite in, uh, in Karachi, and um, and majority of population uh, they had no history of swimming because naturally, when you think about this parasite getting into the nose through contaminated water, one would imagine that if the water is contaminated, we swim in that kind of water, then we may get uh, infected. Uh, but many of the patients who got this infection uh, in Karachi, in Pakistan, they had no history of swimming, suggesting that it's not the uh, swimming related. Um, and no swimming in pools, no swimming in, in the in the sea. Uh, they were all Muslims, interestingly. So, and 90% of them were young males between the age of 18 years old and 35 years old. So we 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 came up with the hypothesis that how come these people are getting infected and they are all you know Karachi is a big city with a population of 25 million people living in the same place. Um, it's very cosmopolitan. But all the patients that we were seeing uh, in the hospital, they were almost always Muslim, suggesting that it seems to be affecting Muslim community the most. So we came up with the hypothesis that it's likely the, the practice of ablution, which is probably how these people are getting uh, infected because of this parasite. Now we all know, being a Muslim myself, we all know that of course, it's a very good practice. It's supposed to cleanse you from contamination, dust, particles, and all that. But it can only be effective if the water that you're using, um, if it's clean, if it's decontaminated, if it does not have the presence of these parasites. So 
is the presence of parasite in the water uh, if it's contaminated and if that water is used for ablution practice then there's a danger that we may contract this particular parasite through that practice so the very practice which is uh, very good in helping us uh, cleanse our body our nostrils and so on but if the water we're using is not um, uh, clean then that can cause problem this deadly problem okay so the uh, uh, the kind of ways how people contact this parasite now we know that ablution is one practice but there are other mechanisms as well so some people who may swim in contaminated water like you see in the bottom right um, uh, picture uh, a boy a young boy swimming in, in, in uh, um, contaminated water uh, and then uh, also nasal cleansing uh, neti pots uh, to uh, unobstruct nasal passage pathway so different mechanism by which you use the uh, water to cleanse or clear uh, nasal passageway and these different um, uh, mechanism may allow if the water is not clean it may allow this parasite to enter the nostrils and then it will slowly migrate to the brain and that can lead to um, post-death the death of the patient so this is a kind of uh, observation we made for example in, in in karachi so this is how people store water because you know karachi Temper temperatures are quite high and it doesn't rain very much, uh, just like here. And this is how people use these uh, rooftop tanks or underground tanks to store water for their daily consumption. But the only unfortunate thing is that if these tanks are not cleaned properly, not cleaned regularly, be that in a mall, be that in a mosque, be that in a house, be that in, you know, in, in different parts of communities, if they're not cleaned properly, if we don't add sufficient chlorine to kill these pathogens, then they may contain these parasites and if we use that for bathing if we use them for ablution if we use them for nasal cleansing then we may end up getting this parasite that can cause serious consequences for the for the patient uh, this is another picture uh, that uh, i took when when we um, i'm originally from pakistan so naturally it's my home country so when i go there so when there is power outage, nowadays it's much better. Uh, I think about 10 years ago, there were lots of power cuts. And this is a um, kind of a small canal um, that goes from city of Lahore all the way down to the, uh, to, to the southern parts of Pakistan. And you see then when there's power cuts, regular power cuts, and the temperature is over 40, as we have it here in the UAE. So, you know, kids and um, younger people, the, the only way for them uh, sometime is to, you know, just uh, turn to these canals and these rivers, to, you know, to cool off a little bit. And, um, and that's where the problem lies. So again, if this, this water is not decontaminated, it's, it's not chlorinated, uh, and uh, it may have the presence of some of these microbial pathogens, these parasites, and, um, you know, it can contribute to uh, serious consequences of this population. And what you see is that there's thousands and thousands of people who are jumping in this um, in this stream and um, and and swimming there, but with uh, sometimes not knowing the danger that's present in these waters. So there has to be more awareness. There has to be more education to ensure that people don't um, you know use this uh, do this, but with caution. So again, if you keep going uh, to, to the southern part, you see that there are, you know, lines and lines of people, hundreds of them actually, you know, jumping in, in this. And then, um, and there's a, you know, when, when I was listening there, when I noticed whether well, there's no, no place, uh, you know, there are no toilet facilities nearby. So, you know, it, it just makes you wonder that uh, these people, it's not just a brain eating amoeba or these parasites, that some of these individuals will be contracting but it's possible there's some other infections they may also contract, suggesting that there's a need for more awareness against infectious diseases. And again, I mean, you know, this just goes on for, for, for many miles, uh, the same story. Uh, so there's uh, in here again, when you go towards near the villages, a kid swimming there, this uh, kid here is not very smart, jumping face down with uh, 
in his nose. And again, if there's some contaminated water, some parasites, pathogens, other infectious agent, they may contract. Uh, this kid is smart. He's at least holding his nose and not allowing these uh, some of these pathogens to get into the nose. So again, very important. When you go towards villages, so again, you know, Pakistan is a fertile land, so the, the water is used for um, uh, agriculture. So then that the river, then stream, then canal, then eventually they turn into the small ponds, uh, and eventually they, they, uh, they, they are taken to villages. So again, kids there, if there's power cut, again, that's where they swim to cool off, and uh, sometimes they will end up contracting these pathogens and these parasites. Um, again, um, similar scenario. So some kids that are playing in that water, which is not very clean. And it's not limited to just uh, those gathering, but also there's a possibility that uh, gathering such as uh, uh, in Ganges River, which I believe that there has a gathering of more than you know 10 million people all in come to, to, to Ganges River for ritual bathing as well. So it's not just so any practice that will allow uh, again um, uh, close contact with uh, with contaminated water can lead to contracting not just brain eating amoeba but other pathogens as well as we have seen that the uh, some of the recent reports suggest that so uh, the the ritual um, bathing in Ganges river they may have contributed also to this um, uh, covid-19 uh, second wave in, in, in india as well so again, it's the lack of awareness sometimes. So, so large crowds are gathering and sometimes swimming, bathing, and exposing each other. And again, there's no monitoring of this water, that what kind of pathogens exist in this water, what kind of parasites are present in this, which people should be aware of before getting into these waters and then maybe exposing themselves to these potential dangers. So why is it so difficult to treat? So the next question is that, okay, we contract because we may come across this kind of water and we may end up getting infected, but why is it so difficult to treat? So two problems, one, that the from contracting the parasite uh, to the host death, it takes around um, uh, three to seven days. So between 72 hours to, to seven days, uh, it results in death of the patient. So that time period is too short. So basically it's a very, very fast infection. So basically parasite gets into the, into the nose, crawls up and goes into the brain and kills the, the patient within days, within hours sometimes. So it's very fast because of this nature of this infection and the kind of symptoms that patients suffer, they're mostly fever, they're mostly headache, uh, neck ache, uh, so, you know, they're very symptom, uh, very similar to some of the other pathogens like bacterial pathogens, like viral pathogens. So naturally, the, the sometimes the lack of awareness means that people end up taking uh, antibiotics themselves. Um, basically, by the time they reach the hospital, sometimes it's too late. And that's where the problem lies. So it's very fast infection if uh, we contract it and then the leads to death very, very quickly. That's why it's difficult to treat. Second problem that we're seeing with the treatment of this infection is the, the mode of treatment. So mostly the drugs which are given for this infection is via intravenous route. So basically, uh, by the time the patient reaches the hospital and um, they are given these drugs which are available and the, uh, they're given intravenously, so they're injected. Uh, for for the injection, so another you have to to kind of be aware that the parasite is sitting in the brain, and the drug is given via the blood vessel. So when it's given via the blood vessel, the drug will go all over the the body, the human body, um, and before reaching the brain. Uh, and brain brain is is kind of very protected by a very very selective uh, blood vessel. So the the amount of drug that reaches the brain is very small compared to what's needed to kill the parasite which is sitting in the brain. So what we proposed uh, was that um, so basically drug is stopped uh, before entering the brain and parasite is sitting in the brain, which means it's very difficult to eradicate it, it's very difficult to kill the parasite which is sitting in the brain. 
So what we propose is that why not you follow the same route the parasite uses to kill the person. So the parasite is going through the nose and slowly crawling up the nose into the brain. Why don't we use the same method for the drug delivery of the for the drug de delivery? So may, instead of giving the drug intravenously, we should give the drug intranasally to, to allow the the drug to reach the brain and follow the parasite. So that's what we have proposed, and that hopefully will allow uh, the drug to to be more effective. Uh, so we, we came up with this. Uh, um, this methodology, where we believe that if we can give drugs um, using a syringe, uh, just like for asthma treatment, you know, normally um, uh, to, to clear the nasal passage, if you can give the uh, drug in, in droplets or in vaporized form, it will follow the same route as a parasite to, to go up the nose into the brain and then hopefully we'll kill the parasite, that will be more effective. Because otherwise, if you give drug intravenously, it will go to the liver, it will go to the heart, it will go to everywhere, the whole body. So you need a lot more concentration of the drug to get to the brain. Uh, but if you buy an intranasal route, we can treat it more effectively. So that's what we're working on right now, trying to improve the, um, the prognosis or the, uh, to save the patient, because at the moment, the mortality, mortality rate is 100%, which means if you get it, you will die because it's parasite. And the, the link between ablution and, 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 and the parasite clearly suggests that we need to come up with a better, better method. It may, it may not be relevant to the, uh, as much relevant to some of the developed countries, but many Muslim countries who are also developing as well, it's directly relevant because not everybody can have access to clean water. Sometimes people have to store water in tanks because they don't have water supplies, and that's where the problems are. So I don't want to go into the detail here. Basically, because of global warming, we know temperatures are going up. And uh, so this, the number of cases, because this, this parasite will go up with that, and the recreational facilities, activities, ritual practices, uh, it presents a risk to more than a billion people. So the number of people who are contracting this infection will probably likely will go up. So that's why we need to come up with new drugs and we need to have better drug delivery methods to be able to um, uh, uh, to be able to treat this infection more effectively. Okay, so that's the power, first part of my uh, talk. Uh, second part, uh, I want to go over the novel sources of antimicrobials. As I mentioned that we keep coming across new superbugs which are emerging, new infections like COVID-19 as well, for example which is emerging. So we, we need to come up with new, new, new kinds of drugs that can control these pathogens, which seems to be affecting our lives, our communities, both regionally as well as globally. And that's what I want to focus on for this part of my presentation. So uh, just in a nutshell, I just want to um, uh, clarify that COVID-19 is not the only killer. Um, uh, there are many, many other infectious diseases that contribute majorly to human misery, to animal health as well, uh, which is what we feed on. Uh, COVID-19 is one kind of uh, disease, but there are other diseases as well. So before COVID-19, so in 20, you know, for many, many years, the, the um, if even if you just look at the top 10 infections, just top 10, not all of them. So top 10 infections worldwide, they kill about 17 million people every year. So every year, despite the fact that we have antibiotics, despite the fact that we have state-of-the-art facilities and antimicrobials and good physicians and good nurses and good doctors and all that, still every single year, 17 million people will, uh, will, uh, will be killed by these top 10 infections. Uh, so again, COVID is, is, an incre uh, is an additional burden on top of that. So clearly suggesting that we ought to um, to come up with new mechanisms to control this infection. We need to come up with new drugs, new sources of antimicrobial if we want to stay ahead of the game. Because it's not just these top 10 infectious diseases which are killing 17 million people approximately every single year for past many decades. But we're also seeing the trend where we are seeing additional infections emerging as well. And some of these pathogens, which are, we are seeing, 
they're also becoming superbugs. So that they are more resistant to these antibiotics and these antimicrobials that we have at our disposal. So basically there's antimicrobial crisis. So we keep seeing the emergence of new infections, new bugs, new superbugs and all that. And um, at the same time, the, the new products that we're seeing in the pharmacy, in the market, are becoming less and less, or at least they're becoming less and less effective. So clearly suggesting there's a need to come up with new antimicrobial. So this slide actually nicely shows the number of uh, uh, antimicrobial products that we see in the market. So from 1983 to 1987, about 16 new antimicrobial came into the market, which were approved by the FDA. Uh, and then in the next five years, the number was reduced to 14, the next five years to 10, and so on. So, and uh, it's only one, two, three, that's the number that we see per year of new product coming to a pharmacy, suggesting that the number of new drugs that we're seeing in the market is becoming less, and the number of uh, pathogens or bugs or infection that we're seeing uh, in our communities are, 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 are increasing. Uh, again, highlighting the need that we need to come up with new antimicrobial. Uh, not only that, um, why I put this slide? <laughs> anyway, I think the, 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 the message here is that <coughs> not only contracting infection from human to human transmission, which is what we see in COVID-19, for example, but also there are pathogens which are jumping from other animals to humans as well. These are known as zoonotic infections. So some of the zoonotic infections, zoonotic pathogens, they jump from animals to humans and then cause additional burden, uh, burden on, on human health. So again, suggesting that we need to come up with new methods of treating them or preventing infection. This is my family. Um, this is uh, Salahuddin on the front. Uh, this is Muhammad. Uh, this is my wife, Rukhaya. This is my daughter, Iman. This is me. And when I had, uh, mashallah, I have uh, two sons and one daughter when we had our family. Um, so a lot of my colleagues, uh, I was working at the University of Nottingham in the UK then, and a lot of my colleagues, so they gave me these books uh, called Germ Proof Your Kids. And the message was very simple. You know, there are so many pathogens out there. There's so many pollution there. You really, really need to... Uh, protect your children against these pathogens. You need to make sure they clean their hands with antibacterial soaps, um, with sanitizers, like the way that we see nowadays. And you really need to make sure that they're always, you know, stay away from unhygienic condition. When they go to the toilet, they wash their hands properly. There's a new soap, antibacterial soaps and all that. That's where we came up with the idea that, uh, okay, we are just one species, you know, um, there are millions and millions of other species which are living on this planet. We are just one. Um, so the question is that even though some of these pathogens and, and microbes are threatening our existence or causing infection to our um, species, Homo sapiens, what about other species? How are they coping with these pressures? Uh, you know, we, we came to this planet according to the fossil records. We came here between 50,000 to 100,000 years ago, Homo sapiens on the planet. But some of the species have been living here for millions and millions of years and very, very successful in adapting, in evolving. So how do they cope with these pressures? Why can't we learn some mechanism from these species and then use them for our benefit? If we know that how do cockroaches, you know, we are protecting our kids against the pollution, against unhygienic condition, uh, and, and so on. What about those very species which are actually thriving in those unhygienic conditions, which actually do live in gutters and those very polluted environments, and yet they're happy, they're thriving, they're increasing in numbers. So the question arises that why our existence is at stake while other species are thriving in the very conditions which seems to be threatening our existence. And that's the purpose of our existing research as well, that how do things like species like cockroaches, they're able to, to, to survive in the most filthy places uh, known to humans, and yet they, they thrive in those conditions, while we have to protect our species, our kids, 
um, by coming up with new antibacterial soap every single day. You know, if you go to a pharmacy, you'll see about 20 different kinds of insect repellents or in, insecticide agent. And when you bring them home, you know, they work for so long. And the kind of insecticide that we've been using over the years, over decades, and still these species are thriving in those conditions. And the kind of antibacterial, antibacterial soaps that you see in the market, again, it begs the question that how do these species survive? So we have to learn from those species which have been inhabiting this planet for millions of years and see how they have done so successfully, evolved, emerged, adapted, while we have to face, we have brought this planet on its knees. And, and, and I think that's the message of this talk. So the relevance to cockroaches is one of the most hated insects. I'm sure, you know, when we see them anywhere, we just step on them. It's one of the most hated insect on the planet. But yet it has so much to teach us. It's one of the most hardiest insect on the planet. Doesn't matter how many insecticides you throw at them, doesn't matter how many insect repellents you throw at them, still they're able to survive. Still they're able to thrive in those conditions. Uh, they can survive without food for more than a month. They can survive without air for more than 45 minutes. They can, they, they can be placed in water for more than 30 minutes. And in the lab, when we take their head off, they can survive. They can still continue to, you know, um, move around for many, many minutes without being uh, killed properly. So, and the, the, the interesting phenomena is that they can tolerate the radiation level. So the radiation level that can kill a human being, they can tolerate 15 times more radiation level and insecticide, and still they are able to, to survive. They are one of the, the, the only species, I believe, uh, or one of the, the few species which can survive a nuclear attack. Um, so again, and they've been here for more than 350 billion years. Uh, again, clearly suggesting that um, the, we ought to learn that what mechanism do they have? What do they have in them that makes them so tough, so hardy, and they can you know, evolve and adapt and, and survive successfully? We ought to learn those mechanisms. We need to pull out those molecules from them. Maybe they have very, very powerful antibiotic molecule in them. Maybe they have very powerful antimicrobial in them. Maybe they have some other immune mechanism which are protecting them. Maybe we should be learning from them. So it's very important to, to, to study them, to understand their physiology. So, you know, people talk about that, uh, what's the next species? So, you know, Homo sapiens, they inherited this planet from other species. So the question raised is that what species is going to, to inherit this planet from us? And normally you hear the term viruses will inherit this planet from us, superbugs. But I feel also roaches are up there as well as uh, one of the candidates that may also in, inherit this planet from us after we are long gone. So again, you know, we ought to learn from them. Uh, and, and use those mechanisms for our benefit, for the benefit of our species, for the benefit of Homo sapiens. I don't want to go into the detail for this. So, you know, similar hypothesis we, we also uh, used for other, other species like locusts as well, which is a major pest, cause famine and devastation. So again, similar question raises that how they are so successful and uh, despite the advances we have made in coming up with the new insecticide and new killing chemicals and all that and still they're they are causing famine and devastation and, and all that so they must have mechanism in them and how why only humans are suffering at the time when i work, uh, when i started this research i was working with the in the uk at the university of nottingham and i was um, um with some approval. And I was um, uh, working with the Ministry of Defense and we were seeing the, the patients and uh, these patients were, um, uh, so the question was that how come they are not um, uh, getting this infection while we were, okay. I don't know, something happened, somebody has, okay, sorry. So what we've, we've done is that, um, so the, to test this hypothesis, maybe they have something in them, which is protecting them 
against the very COVID uh, SARS virus, against the, the superbugs, against bacteria, against brain-eating amoeba, against all the pathogens that we are afraid of in contracting. Maybe they have something in them which is protecting them against contracting these pathogens. So we tested this idea by culturing these. They're very simple to culture. You give them anything and they will, they will feed on. Um, so they're very easy to culture in the lab. So we culture them and then we collect their blood. Their blood is also known uh, because they're invertebrates. They're known as the hemolymph, but for, for simplicity, I'll just call it blood. We collect their blood, we collect their uh, organs, fat bodies to find out what's in them, which is so potent that they do not get infected, which is so potent that they are able to thrive and survive in such polluted environment. And we take off their head and then we <coughs> isolate the <coughs> their uh, the, the brain part and to find out that uh, how they are able to, uh, to to survive and same thing procedure we do for uh, cockroaches as well so different insects we take out the organs brains muscles fat body all organs to find out what's in them which is making them so so tough and interestingly and we test this material that we isolate from them we test the material against the superbugs. So one of the superbugs <clears throat> that we wanted to test against is known as MRSA. Um, it's also, the full name is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. This is a, one of the bacterial pathogen which is very resistant and is commonly found in hospitals. And it's a major uh, problem in, especially in the UK hospital. And because I was working in the UK at the time, so much of our research was funded by the UK. Uh, government, so that's why we we were working on this uh, this bacteria. So what you see is that in the in the bottom plate, you see that the bacteria alone, which are you know forming these colony-like structures, these are basically bacteria. So these bacteria were growing fine normally, but when you put the brain of or other lysates or the blood of these cockroaches and, and locusts, what you see is that there's a complete kill of those superbugs. So this finding suggested that there is something in these cockroaches or locust uh, um, organs which is killing these bacteria very, very potently, very effectively. So it can kill up to a million bacteria very effectively, suggesting that um, we, we ought to find out what, are the, what is the chemical makeup of, um, of their brains and other organs. And, and this work uh, was highlighted then in the science news. Uh, so, you know, we got very intri um, intrigued by these findings that, okay, they may have something in them. Because, you know, when you think about uh, uh, much of the antibacterial properties or antimicrobial -mic properties, so, you know, what our families teach us, you know, my mother is, I mean, if you eat garlic, garlic is very good for your health because it can kill bacteria and so on, or ginger or spices or red chilies or yogurt and so on. So for the first time, what we showed was that uh, not just these plant products, but also uh, animal-based products can also be very useful and they may have some interesting properties in them that can kill these uh, bacteria. So Science News, they were very interested. It's a US-based magazine. Um, the New Scientist is a UK-based magazine. They were all very intrigued by this finding. Um, and the BBC, they were very interested. They came to our lab actually and they filmed all this, uh, how we you know, take out the organs, how do we dissect them, how do we test them against different kinds of pathogen, and they are a potential source of antibiotics to fight MRSA and possibly other pathogen as well. So our message is uh, hopefully that through this research that you know, cockroaches will uh, hopefully make their affection uh, of the human race. So when you see them in the anywhere, you don't step on them, please bring them to me so we can make some use out of them. Uh, so that's the, the key message that I wanted to give. So a lot of people ask me that, okay, so what do you suggest um, that we should have cockroach farms? So every time somebody get infected, you know, even like the SARS virus or COVID-19, how do, how are cockroaches protected or other species protected from that? That's not what you're saying, that you should have cockroach farm and that's the kind of material we need to feed or give to patient. No, what we're saying is that we isolate these molecules from them, we synthesize them in the lab, and then we use them for, for, uh, for our benefit, for the benefit of homo sapiens. 
We also shown that these uh, molecules that we have isolated, they do not have any effect on human cells. And again, uh, my apologies for uh, this a little bit more complex slide, but basically these are the human brain cells. And um, when you, we put the uh, pathogen on them, you see the complete disruption of, uh, of the monolayer. And when you treat the um, uh, bacteria um, pathogen with the, the organ lysates of these cockroaches, you see that the monolayer is protected. The human cells are protected, suggesting they do not, basically, in a nutshell, they do not affect uh, the human cells. They only affect the bacteria that are uh, working in them. And then naturally, we need to know what are the molecules in them. So we're using analytical tools. I don't want to go into detail. Basically, uh, from the, the brain, we have isolated more than 200 different kinds of molecules, and we have identified 20 of these molecules, and they belong to different groups, and they belong to different, um, um, uh, they belong to different groups, and we are trying to then find out that how we can use them more effectively against uh, the, our fight uh, with the infectious agent. So there are a lot more work to be done. So what we uh, now we have expanded our hypothesis in saying that um, uh, it's not just the cockroaches we ought to learn from other species as well. Uh, well. Why limit ourselves to cockroaches? So when you think about it, you know there are other species like uh, snakes. Now snakes eat rats or, or germ infested rodents, and rats, as you know, they are notorious in um, in having these germs and living in. Un polluted environment, unhygienic condition, and yet, you know, these snakes can eat live rats without getting infected. You know, I, I cannot, my mother cooks chicken curry, and <laughs> she cooks it to death, literally, by putting spices and so much heating and all that. Yet, these species and these snakes are thriving on live rats, which is just incredible. Uh, we ought to learn from them. Uh, same thing about crocodile. Crocodile is an incredible species. The crocodile have been here for more than 300 million years. One of the you know older species, uh, and what do they eat? They eat rotten meat. Uh, even if you give them clean meat, they'll make it rot uh, before they will feed on that. And by rot, we mean that you know the meat will be yellowish, gooey, and you know that's the smell they like. To them, that's the you know the biryani or whatnot. So the question is um, that how come they and if we, we cannot imagine feeding on that kind of material and able to live because we will definitely get infected so the question is how do these species they are able to survive and thrive on this meat and these unhygienic and polluted environment yet we have to protect ourselves our our species against you know so many prob same problems that that are not threatening these species so we looked at uh, crocodile. Crocodile is a, is a very interesting species. I like crocodile. I think that they have so much to teach us and we, we can learn so much from them. Number one, you know, many people ask this question that, you know, you work on cockroaches, but cockroaches' lifespan is limited. They don't live many, many years. Uh, but, and maybe that's why there's so many numbers, it's difficult to overcome them. And so crocodile is one of the interesting species that has a lifespan. They can live up to 100 years, you know, and and they're always, uh, they're, many times they're fighting, they get injuries, uh, they don't get antibiotic treatment, they self-heal, suggesting that they have these molecules in them. Uh, uh, and, uh, and they're always sunbathing. Um, you know, we put all these creams and everything when we go out, they don't. And one of the interesting facts that you may like to know is that crocodile, they do not develop cancer. Uh, one in two human beings will get cancer in their lifetime, one in two, for some of the countries like UK. But crocodile, they don't get cancer, yet they are always in the sun. If you visit a crocodile farm, what you will see is that the water they live in is full of heavy metal, the heavy metal that we, we cannot expose ourselves. Uh, and yet they are able to, to thrive in those material contaminated food, uh, rotten meat, uh, heavy metal environment, and always sunbathing. Yet they don't get cancer, and the the, the infection or the injuries they get, they generally self heal, suggesting they must have some powerful molecule that we need to learn from them. This is the the uh, so we got the uh, uh, permission, but crocodile is also a protected species. We can't just take a crocodile and start working in the lab. 
um, for our uh, research. So normally we have to get permission from the government because it's a protected species. Um, so so we, we got the permission from two countries, one from Malaysia, they have a huge population of cro crocodile and also from Pakistan. And um, we, we went to uh, visit the crocodile farm and this is the, where they live. You can see the water they're swimming in. Uh, and we isolated brain eating amoeba and heavy metals and pathogens and viruses, all kinds of stuff in these waters. Yet these crocodiles are thriving. And uh, in actually in Malaysia, in some parts of Malaysia, they actually pay you money to kill a crocodile because the population is so much. So, uh, you know, again, uh, begging the question that how do they survive and thrive in these conditions, which can be so detrimental to Homo sapiens? This is the meat that they was being fed to these crocodile, and so I asked, him, I tell you that the kind of smell you get from this meat is horrible. So I asked the manager that why don't you give them clean meat instead of giving such contam contaminated and gooey meat. So he said, yeah, we actually used to give them clean meat, but they make it rot before they feed on that. Again, highlighting that um, that's the smell or that's the way they, they, they enjoy this meat. Um, so again, why don't they get infected you know, from feeding on this kind of material, which can clearly uh, cause serious consequences for, for our health. So we got uh, permission to collect one adult crocodile. So we selected this particular one adult. And uh, these are our brave researchers who are working on that. So you see the crocodile next to them. Um, and so we collected one crocodile from the farm. We brought them to the university. And uh, so it's about 14 feet long, very, very scary. Uh, it was interesting. Um, so this, the, the government also sent a team with, with us as well. Naturally, you know, we, we, we're not expert to know how to handle a crocodile. So they wanted to make sure for our safety, to make sure that we are okay. So they brought the crocodile. Uh, and so we dissected the crocodile. We got a lot of meat. That was an interesting day. Uh, we got huge amount of meat you can imagine i wanted to have a crocodile barbecue party but then uh, my mother told me that it's not halal so unfortunately <laughs> i didn't but anyway point is that you can lot, get a lot of material from crocodile a lot of biomass suggesting that uh, you know you can do many interesting uh, experiments in the lab and so we the we, same same kind of methodology we took out different organs and tested them against different kinds of pathogen to find out what's in them, what kind of molecules are present in this crocodile. And that's the, the research that we're doing. So crocodile, we isolated hundreds of molecules from them and we are in the process of identifying them, that which molecule can be very useful in killing viruses or bacteria or parasites and so on. We're also working on um, python. Python is another interesting species uh, and um, it eats uh, you know small pigs. It eats small vertebrates, other uh, and live in, in unhygienic condition. Water monitor lizard, these are one of the very large lizard that you see in, in, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, um, very, very large. Um, and uh, so we are also looking at them because they feed on very polluted environment uh, and, and live in that. Uh, tortoise, another species we are looking at, uh, tortoise are life lifespan of nearly 200 years. So again, begging the question that how they're able to survive such a long life and um, and not get infected or problems and we need to learn from them. This is a, a crocodile dundee team uh, and they are actually the people who, who do all the hard work and uh, make this research possible. So our, our hope is that one day we can bring some of these molecules into the market in a pharmacy so that we can benefit from this collectively. We're also building capacity in this research as well. So bringing our younger generation. This is, again, uh, Salahuddin and Muhammad. This is Rukeya. So you know, we try to expose them to this research as well to, to highlight that uh, we need to build, we, have to, we need to have new research. And that's the purpose of also presenting to you as well, those of you who are interested in this kind of research and want to take part. And do keep in touch if you want to just know what we are up to and what kind of findings we are we are getting uh, feel free to get in touch and um, we always look for mechanism to re increase awareness at the same time uh, bring uh, build our capacity in this discipline 
Uh, again, uh, just last uh, few slides, uh, I'm running, running out of time. So uh, snake is another species that we're looking at. So for snakes, uh, we thought, okay, we look at uh, cobra. Cobra is, you know, is one of the scariest snakes that we have in Pakistan. And so we decided to look at that. There are 67 species of cobra in Pakistan alone. So again, we, we, uh, we get uh, professional help. We don't try to do this ourselves. Okay, you need to take the venom out to make sure that I'm not handling, I would be hopeless in the, we take the venom out from these, um, these species and then do the usual thing, which is uh, dissecting different parts of the body of these species. And then, uh, you know, the, the intestine, esophagus, fat bodies, all kinds of tissue, and then testing them, they're blurred as well, and testing them, heart, lung, liver, uh, kidneys, intestine, gallbladder, all these kinds of tissue and testing them against different pathogens, bacterial pathogen, viral pathogen, parasitic pathogen, all kinds of pathogen. And then we find out whether if they are effective, then we try to identify the molecules. And, you know, problem is when you go down to the molecular level, there are thousands of molecules. And that's where it gets a little bit tricky because for each molecule, when you do research, then you end up, you, you need serious commitment, you need lots of money, financial resources, and that's where then things sometimes slow down because funding agency, they want to give funds for dedicated, just, you know, individual projects. And um, so things tend to slow down when we're looking at the characterization, when we're identifying these specific molecules. So, uh, well, this one last concept I want to share with you. So, so far our focus was that, you know, there is something these animals, these species are producing and this is probably the immune system, you know, like COVID-19, you hear that, uh, um, um, that the immune system, which is why we're getting vaccinated, right? So we'll have more antibodies against this virus. So this is the immune system, which is making us stronger. And so it's the immune system of those species, which is making them stronger. But we have recently started looking at gut bacteria as well. You know, we have more gut bacteria in our gut as part of our us. We have more gut bacteria in our gut than the, the, the human cells in our body. So that again begs the question that why do we have so, so many bacteria? And there's, you know, common saying that we are more bacteria than we are humans, uh, suggesting that because we have more number of cells in our gut of bacteria and we have less number of human cells, so we cannot just ignore them. They may be, they must be, con not maybe, sorry, I rephrase, they must be contributing to the um, human physiology to the well-being and that's why you see you know these uh, these kind of um, actimals um, you know these kind of things in the market right uh, i drink as well because what is this so basically we want to increase the number of good bacteria in our gut because if our gut is healthy that's a common saying if the gut is healthy then we will have a healthy life as well so it's not just the immune system that's one part but we need to have a gut bacteria so our question and our uh, uh, hypothesis again is that maybe it's the immune system, but at the same time, it's the gut bacteria as well that is producing some molecule, which is probably also contributing to killing these parasites and pathogens and these viruses and, and all that as well. Um, so, so what we're doing now in the lab, and this is where you know, some of you who are interested want to be part of it or just want to know, feel free to uh, get in touch. Uh, that um, uh, how they are able to um, so we are isolating these uh, bacteria from the from the uh, insects and then putting them on uh, the, these uh, bacteria from the gut of these insect these animal then culturing them and then trying to find out that how do they uh, what do they produce these bacteria so far our focus was the immune system but now we are increasingly interested in the gut bacteria then what does gut bacteria produces and uh, what kind of molecules is being produced by the gut bacteria from these animals maybe it's the gut bacteria that's producing interesting molecule which is resulting in, um, in, in making these species very very strong and that's a huge you know amount of research we need to do because you can imagine the how many kinds of gut bacteria we have or these species have there are hundreds of them or thousands of them and that's where the problem lies, that again, it just slows down because we need you know, more resources, more people to work in this discipline and, uh, and so on. 
So what are the discovery opportunities? Huge, you know, so far I, I only touched on just few of the species, but when you think about it, uh, you know, it will come to you that uh, how do these crows, uh, crows is, is a notorious species, is always in, uh, in, in near pollution and uh, garbage areas, vultures as well, another interesting species, uh, vertebrates uh, or many of the uh, marine animals, you know, in, in many cities, even cities like Karachi, which is my own, own country, that sometimes the sewage goes directly from the, from the city into the sea without much treatment. And that begs the question that how come that all that pollution going into the sea will result in uh, what kind of impact it will have in those species which are living, inhabiting those environments. So we, we, again, we need to go into the marine environment as well to learn that how do those species uh, cope or survive in those environments. Uh, birds captured, lizards, snakes, crocodiles, uh, you know, there are so many other species that we need to look at, scorpions and, and whatnot, that how do they cope with such pressure. Uh, and not only that, um, also the microbes which are living in the, these polluted environment, how do they cope with um, these pressures? How do they, uh, how are they able to uh, survive? Maybe we need to pull them out from there, screen them, find out, and then pull out those molecules from them. And these molecules can be brought to the, to uh, for the benefit of our, uh, for homo sapiens. So I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, and just want to thank people who have been part of this work. And as you can imagine that uh, this work uh, is not funded by just one agency, but many agencies. So I used to work in the UK, in the US, in Malaysia, Pakistan. So all those agencies are interested in this kind of work and they, they we are very thankful for the support. Uh, and there are many universities, many colleagues who are were involved in this work, but most importantly, I'm thankful to these species who have contributed their lives uh, to this work. And without that, uh, it will not be possible. And thank you very much for, for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Minavid, for these valuable and precious uh, information that you have gave us uh, for in today's lecture. We have one question in the chat. Uh, it says, it is nice to know all this information, but does that have any way to help increase the human immunity? I think the question um, is, yeah, you can sorry. ask me, doctor. Okay. Um, yeah, well, very, very important question. Uh, and thank you for asking this. Uh, so if I get your question right, because it just got disconnected a little bit. Uh, the, but what you're asking is that whether some of these things will increase human immunity. Yeah, I think the yeah, question sure. is unclear a bit. So uh, we ask Sarah to ask the question again uh, to be clear and for the doctor to answer it. Uh, thank you, doctor. Uh, again, you can uh, unshare your uh, screen now. Okay, I think I've tried. We'll I wait one to two minutes uh, to see if we have any other questions in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I'll try to answer the first question that you just asked. So I think the question was whether it can boost the immunity. Uh, so yes, so some of these things can. Uh, and uh, we, you know, what we're trying to say is that sometimes we create a bubble-like environment. And sometimes it's not a bad thing to, to be exposed uh, and uh, to isolate these molecules and then use them to build our immunity as well. And that's the purpose of this research, that how can we, because exposing ourselves to pollution can can cost us in terms of disability, in terms of mortality and so on. So that's not something I would recommend. My recommendation is that if we can pull out these molecule, specific molecule, and give them to human, that's what we need to be doing. And hopefully that's the aim of this. We will come up with that. Thank you, doctor, for the answer. And uh, she's telling us that, yes, doctor, you get you got me. So um, thank you, doctor, for your answer. And we thank you again for uh, this uh, valuable information that you have shared for us. Uh, this is, um, I don't know if I'm sharing or not. Um, Until we have um, some other questions, if we don't have any questions, we will um, 
Yeah, we have a comment. Thanks a lot, doctor, for Thanks. this valuable uh, information. So I think there are no uh, more questions uh, to answer, doctor. Thank you for your time and uh, thank you for the great lecture that you have gave us. Thank you. Have a Thanks good so day. much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.